Polo class. In this video, we're going to be looking at displaying and describing numerical distributions. The learning intention of this video is for us to explore how numerical data is organized and displayed, to develop an understanding of ungrouped and grouped frequency tables, and for us to learn how to construct a histogram. Please recall that numerical data involves collecting numbers, and we can collate and display these data in a number of meaningful ways. One of the ways that we could display numerical data is by using a frequency table. Another way is by constructing a histogram. Other forms of graphs also include a stem and leaf plot, a dot plot, as well as a box plot. But in today's lesson, we're only going to be concentrating on a frequency table as well as histograms. So please recall that frequency tables can be used to display both categorical as well as numerical data. However, depending on the numerical data provided to us, we could display the frequency table in two main ways. So when we're dealing with smaller data sets, we could display ungrouped data in the frequency table. And this just means where we just need to report and list down every raw data that's found. An example of an ungrouped frequency table is shown down below. So in this particular table over here, we literally need to list down every single value that we've collected in our data set. This is okay for this particular data set because A, you're dealing with discrete numbers in this case, so you're getting nice whole numbers, and B, the range of responses are actually quite limited. So it's only between 146 to 150 centimeters in terms of the height. However, when you're dealing with data sets that are much more larger, or when you're dealing with continuous data, it might be more useful for us to display the data using a grouped frequency table. And what we do for this is we essentially group or chunk the data set into smaller intervals. An example of this is shown down below. By chunking the data set into smaller groups, what this allows us to do is that it allows us to make sense of the data set a lot more easier, but it also makes the size of the frequency table a lot more shorter and a lot more condensed. And this would look a lot more neater as opposed to listing down all the heights from 130 to 154 centimeters, making a much more longer table. Let's now look at an example of how we can create a frequency table for ungrouped data. So in this particular example, notice that you're dealing with discrete data and the range of responses in this particular example are quite limited. So to do this, again, what we need to do is we just need to define the variable in this cell here. So in this case, it's going to be talking about the number of siblings and I'm going to list down all of the options available down the column. The question has also said that there's 30 responses in total. So therefore, I'm going to put the total as 30. And now I'm going to tally up the frequencies for each response. So the number of students that reported zero siblings is six. The number of students who reported having one sibling is seven. And let's do the same thing for the rest of the table. So I'm just going to quickly fill out all of the other data. Now to fill in the last column to find out what is the percentage frequency, please recall that we need to use this formula here. So this can be determined by getting the frequency and dividing it by the total, then multiplying by 100. So if you do this, you should get these values over here if you round it to one decimal place. And all of these values should add up to 100%, which in this case it does. Let's now talk about grouped frequency tables. So we need to group data when we're dealing with much larger data sets as it is much more efficient to display a range of values as opposed to listing down every single individual value as this will make our columns ridiculously long. When we do chunk our data into smaller groups, we refer to these little groups or ranges as class intervals, also known as classes for short. And we could both chunk and group our data sets for discrete as well as continuous data. To demonstrate this, I provided an example of a grouped frequency tables for both discrete and continuous data. Now that we know what a grouped frequency table looks like, let's now talk about how do we actually make one. When we're making a grouped frequency table, it's really important that we choose the correct size of our chunks so that we can actually make comments about the shape and spread of the distribution. And we'll talk about this in a later video, but for now, just understand that it's really important that we choose our size correctly. When you're constructing a grouped frequency table, we need to ensure the following things. We need to ensure that the size of each intervals are the same, so the size of each chunk. We also need to ensure that the intervals do not overlap one another. And lastly, we need to ensure that there are no gaps between intervals. A good general rule of thumb is that when we're trying to split the data or trying to chunk the data, we should try to make about four to five equal categories depending on the data that's being displayed. Let's go through one question together. So for this question, we're going to create a grouped frequency table that shows the marks of 40 students. For this question over here, remember that we're going to try to aim to create four to five class intervals, which is why I've deliberately have five rows over here. To create a grouped frequency table properly, it's a lot more easier for me to show you some incorrect examples first so you can see what not to do so that you can actually do the correct thing later on. 
So on this particular slide over here, this is an example of an incorrect grouped frequency table because the size of the intervals are not the same at all. So if you look very closely, notice that this class interval actually has six digits in between, starting from zero, including zero, to five, whereas all the other values have a class interval range of five. Because the class interval sizes throughout the entire table is not consistent, therefore this is an incorrect example of a grouped frequency table. Another common mistake that I often see is that students often overlap intervals. So what I mean by this is that notice how in this particular row or in this class interval, it goes from zero to five, but in the second class interval, it also goes from five to 10. So because five in this case appears in both class intervals, therefore there is an overlap. Similarly, 10 overlaps between the second and the third class interval and so forth. So please do not make this mistake when you're creating your grouped frequency table. And finally, the next common mistake I often see students do is that they create gaps between their class intervals. So notice that in this particular example, there is a class interval missing between the values of 10 to 14. I would also like to further add that even if there were actual no values between 10 to 14 in the original data set, which there are in this case, we don't just exclude a class interval. We still need to represent it in the grouped frequency table and list zero as its frequency. So on the next slide, I'm about to show you a correct group frequency table for this particular data set. So in this data set over here, notice that the size of each class intervals are the same. So in each of these class intervals, notice that the range in this case is five. There's five digits in between each class interval. Secondly, it has no intervals that overlap. So no numbers appear twice in each class interval. And lastly, there are no gaps between each interval. Now that I've successfully chosen my grouping intervals, I can now start completing the table. So I'm just going to report down all the frequencies and find its total. And once we're done with that, we can therefore draw a graph using this information here. So if we were to draw this, this is what it will look like. And this particular graph is what we refer to as a histogram. Let's now have a go answering some questions. So for this question, I want you to identify what is the size of the class intervals in the frequency table below. If you answer this question correctly, it should be 10. For the next question, I want you to choose an appropriate size class interval for the following data set. So this question means, are you going to chunk it in groups of five, groups of two, groups of 10, groups of four, what are you going to choose? So for this particular data set, I can see that the minimum value is two and the maximum value is 40. Because we're trying to aim to get between four to five class intervals, it makes sense that in this example, it would be appropriate to have a class interval sizes of 10. Using this answer, I want you to identify what should be the range of the first class interval. In other words, this means that the grouping should be made between what two numbers for the first class interval. Since we know that the class interval size is 10, we're going to make our first class interval between the values zero to nine. So therefore, if I know this, my second class interval should be between the values 10 to 19 and so forth. You may be wondering why didn't I make my first class interval between the values one to 10? And this is a very valid answer because there's still 10 numbers in between this class interval. The reason why this is the case is because that for our beginning number of the first class interval, we prefer to use multiples of five. So this just means that we prefer to use numbers like five, 10, 20, 30, as well as zero, because five times zero is equal to zero. So any multiples of five, that's the number that we like to start off our class interval with. And this is reflected in this example down below. As you can see, the first value of each of the class intervals is a multiple of five. Let's carry on and complete the remaining table. So what I've done over here is I've just reported the frequency in which numbers lie between those values. And now to calculate the percentage, remember it's just frequency divided by the total multiplied by 100. And each of these percentages over here should add up to 100%. For the next question, I want you to tell me what is the percentage of people who spend less than 20 hours on the internet? To answer this question, we're going to refer to the frequency table and look for values that are below 20 hours. In this case over here, these are the two values that are below 20 hours. So to answer this question, we're just going to add up these two percentages. As a result, the answer is going to be 50%. Let's now talk about histograms. So histograms display numerical data using bars to display the frequency in a very similar way that a bar graph does. In a histogram, you'll find exact values or the class intervals found in the x-axis or in the horizontal axis, whereas the frequency is found on the vertical axis. Just a reminder, but histograms are different from a bar graph because bar graphs display categorical data. One more thing that I would like to add is that histograms will look slightly different when you've got exact values or ungrouped data versus a histogram with intervals or grouped data.
Let me show you an example of this. So on the next slide over here, notice I've got a histogram for an unorganized discrete data. And when you've got examples like this, when you're dealing with exact values, notice how the actual data value is located at the center of the column. In contrast, when you're dealing with histograms that has grouped continuous data, notice how the bars are now located in between the class intervals themselves. The last thing that I want to talk about is how do we find the measures of centers from a histogram? So remember that the measure of centers include the mean, the median, and the mode. When we're talking about frequency tables or histograms, we could easily identify what is the mode, also referred to as the modal interval. And this is defined as the value or the range of values where you get the most response. So in this example over here, the modal interval is going to be between the heights of 180 and 184.9 centimeters. What I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to answer questions one all the way to questions five from exercise 2D. Do not go beyond this because all the other questions require a CAS calculator, which we will do back at school. Thank you guys for watching this video and I'll see you guys again in the next one. Bye.